And, and I'm going to wish everybody a, uh, a very happy holiday. Um, it's basically uh, less than, a, well, it's exactly a week before Christmas, uh, 2019. And um, I'm sure everybody is getting excited for, for time off and to see family and, um, you know, and, and, and to have a good time. And for our very last EdShed Interactive of 2019, tonight we have Brianna Hodges, who is going to be uh, conducting a discussion on storytelling. And my name is Mitch Weisberg, so I want to welcome everybody. And Brianna, um, you know, thank you. Thank you for coming. And this is really a, a kind of a little bit of a preview of at least one of the sessions you're doing at FETC. Um, so just maybe start off, what, what else are you talking about at FETC? Do you, do you remember? Because <laughs> well, there's like five different <laughs> things, right? I know. I'm kind of hard pressed to, to keep them. I can't, I can't give you all the titles, that's for sure. But I think I can kind of hit the highlights of it. So um, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a true pleasure. And I'm really excited to be here. If you don't know, I'm from Texas. Um, I'll throw in a couple of y'alls and I'm sure you'll, you'll get that here in a little bit if you See, I know I like you. very much. But <laughs> we're all good people, right? It's yeah. a friendly state. So, um, but I am, I, I'm, I'm super busy at FETC this year. So excited about that. I'm going to be doing um, a lot of things around coaching. So very blessed and fortunate to be um, affiliated with Future Ready. I am the, um, the one of the advisors and spokesperson for Future Ready Instructional Coaches. So we um, have a full day, a, a pre-shop, if you will, for FETC over um, instructional coaching. And I've got uh, several different sessions around um, instructional coaching. Specific, one of them that I know that I can remember for sure is around um, implementation. So once you start doing these implementation um, initiatives, typically around a one-to-one -one or, um, you know, those tech-rich environments, um, what do you do to actually get implementation going? So uh, how do we how do we move into that? And how does instructional coaching really um, drive us into uh, that opportunity? So doing a lot around that, talking about interactive learning, um, specifically for professional learning. So a lot of times we talk about um, our smaller learners, our, our shorter learners, um, when we talk about interactive learning, but um, sometimes we forget what that looks like from a professional learning standpoint. So doing some of that and and then, of course, some story conversations. So I'm um, really excited to get those things. It's not, it's not too awful far from now. We're less than a, less than a month out. So it's hard to believe right, that it's just right. around the corner. For sure. And as, as you're talking about coaching, it seems to me that storytelling is also part of coaching. Or could be. Absolutely. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I like to say there are two things that every single one of us, um, no matter what, our true um, occupation is, our, our financial income occupation is, but every one of us um, are storytellers and every one of us are educators because mm -hmm. basically what we're doing is we're taking our information, our story, our content, and we're trying to get that across to other people. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today of what does that look like uh, when we talk about story, what do we actually mean by that, and, um, and, and how does that come into to education so mm -hmm. yeah um and then i just want to let people know that um we've pr pretty much muted people temporarily but you can unmute yourself if um if you have a question or there's a chat uh, group chat and i've been you know it's just typing some introductory information into the group chat so if you have a question or comment you can either unmute yourself and ask it or, or make a comment um or type it into the group chat in which case i'll read it out and um, and I'll ask it. So, um, so Brianna, you know, um, you, you, do you have slides or what do you want? How do you want to? I do. I yeah. do. Yeah. I have some slides if I can yeah, go great. ahead and start sharing. sharing it. So, yep. Give me one second and I will hopefully. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Do you see? Perfect. Awesome. Okay. So well, um, if, you, if you're ready, then we'll go ahead and get rocking and rolling and, and let's, jump in. Let's roll. So, so real, really quickly, I am Brianna Hodges. I am from Texas. And um, uh, there's all different kinds of ways that you can contact me. But um, most for most part, across social media, I am B Hodges EDU and would love to, uh, you know, Follow, follow up with any questions, conversations, anything that um, that you have out there would love to help. So without further ado, let's just jump in and go. So uh, for many of, 
for many people, and I will say for myself as well, I spent most of my life thinking that story was something that was written down in a book, or it was this wonderful thing that was either made up or was like this incredible achievement that, um, you know, only a few people got to have, and that that was how we had these stories, that they weren't necessarily something that every single person had. You had to be a special person to have a story written about you, and you had to have a, uh, you had to be a special person in order to share stories. And um, what I've noticed along the way as, I, as I've gotten older and um, had more experiences is that that's really not the case and that everything that we do in everywhere we are and every conversation that we have is actually story. So let's jump in and, and kind of talk about that. So I, I know a lot of people are probably out there going, uh-huh, yeah, you can already tell she must be an English teacher. So yes, all cards on the table. I was an English teacher. I was a secondary English teacher. My undergrad is in English, um, but I wasn't always a, a, a teacher. So we're going to kind of walk through a little bit of that. But um, we often think that, you know, there's really not a lot to story outside of those humanities. And um, you're probably saying, yeah, that's great. I like to read. I like to go to the movies. But story doesn't really, you know, it's not my thing. I'm a science teacher or I'm a math person or, you know, I have that real job that means that I have to actually do data and, um, you know, crunch those numbers. But the fact of the matter is, is that all of it is kind of intertwined and, and we're going to jump in to, to kind of look at what that looks like um, in this conversation. So, you know, as we as we start to talk through story, um, hopefully you're going to see how it really is connected in in truly everything that we um, that that we interact with, that we digest, and that we want to have some conversations around. So. Um, that said, uh, as I said, I was a middle school teacher. I, I started out my career in politics, which uh, is, is I don't talk a whole lot about because it's kind of like Fight Club, right? Like you don't talk about it outside of Fight Club. But, um, but what, what I will say is that I, um, I spent about 10 years in politics as um, mainly as a, a national um, fundraiser. And so I spent a lot, a lot of time um, talking to people and um, writing stories and, and doing all these things. And one of the things that I found out is that what you need to do in those situations is you need to take um, a person and help humanize them through stories and that's how you build connections and when the more that you can build that connection um, the more people will support and advocate for the platform or the person as they go into it and uh, so I, I, I left um, political fundraising and went um, into corporate work and started um, working for nonprofits and then moved into corporate healthcare as the um, marketing and PR director. And, um, the re and, and what I learned there is that when you, especially around healthcare, if you have these really, really scary um, concepts and you've got to get them across to people. I mean, I don't know how many of you have had, uh, had, had medical procedures of, of any Sort, but um, oftentimes the doctor will say, okay, we're going to do this, but don't Google it, right? Because you'll just scare yourself. And so um, my job was to take these really, really scary things and um, create opportunities for people to digest them and to not feel as nervous about it. And so what we did was we used interviews and we used infographics and we used animations and we used testimonials and all these different things. Um, that created this relatable story for people to feel like they could make it through. And, um, and, and, and so then when I went into the classroom, I, I fell back on what I knew, which was to take this really complex information, like ethos, pathos, and logos, and um, create it uh, in, a, in a comfortable situation for my students through story. Because they ask that one question that we all hear all the time, regardless of what grade you teach, and regardless of who you are as a person, which is that word, you know, that one that starts with why. So why do we need to know this myth? And what is this going to have, you know, what's this going to do for me? And, um, and, 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 you know, like I said, moving into that classroom situation, I realized that story was going to be at the heart of all of it. So, um, so that said, let's, let's kind of roll into some brain science around this because again, um, I can already, I, I know looking at some of these questions that we had coming in, a lot of us 
um, we have, there's a stigma around story. And it's this idea that, that it's this, you know, shiny, fluffy, sweet thing that starts with once upon a time and is really truly for the humanities. But, um, you know, what happens when we have all of this content that we have to get across and so much of our time in the classroom is spent really trying to get this core content, these facts, this, you know, that information across to our people. So, um, you know, if I, if I just pause here for a second and I say, what does a fact mean? You know, I'm sure that we could start shouting out some of these responses and it would look like true or mathematical or scientific or, you know, that favorite word real, uh, you know, that it's proven. That's what fact means. And, and so often we, we categorize fact and fiction. We talk about story because it's fiction. And then fact is that real stuff, right? Fact is that stuff that if you're a math teacher, if you're a science teacher, that's where you live. And then fiction is the stuff that's, that's made up of story. But, um, you know, if I, if I went through this really quickly, you know, I could start asking you, like, what is two plus two? Two plus two is four. Yellow plus blue makes green, right? And noun is you can start answering these questions because these are our facts that we've, you know, come up with. And most of the time, as we start flipping through each one of these things, and I ask you to name the planets or whatever, we have all of these fun ways that we teach our kids um, what this information is. And so often it starts to come in the form of rhyme or, um, you know, some kind of made up story or, or whatever the case is to really kind of reinforce that. Um, so if I, if I could get everybody to kind of play a quick little game with me, um, you know, it'll, it'll help get you guys engaged in what I'm doing and, and it'll give me a little bit of a break. So if everybody can just grab a piece of paper for a second, what I'm going to ask you to do is, and this is going to take us about 15 seconds, um, but if you'll just grab a piece of paper, I'm going to ask you to take a look at something and then um, you're going to write down what's on the piece of paper. And so hopefully, you know, I mean, I can't be like right next to you and checking for cheating, but I know that we're all honest people. We're not just going to cheat. So uh, now that everybody's got a chance to, to pull up something, I'm going to ask you to take a look at these letters and then um, we're going to go from there. So without further ado, you have 15 seconds to take a look at these questions, at, at these letters. You're not writing them down. What you're trying to do is memorize them. All right, so two seconds. Okay, so now without further ado, I want you to write them down. So you've got 15 seconds to write down as many of those letters as you can. Two seconds left and awesome. Okay, so if I can get you guys to, you know, unmute your, unmute yours if you got more than 10, um, if you got more than 10 letters right in here, uh, at, you know, if you've got, how many of you got 10 down, 10 letters down, maybe? Anybody? Yeah, I had um, 11, actually. Okay. Okay. Did anybody have more than 11? Mitch jumped in and he has 11. Nobody? Okay. Did anybody have more than 22? Okay, good, because there were there aren't 22. So at least we all know that we're, we're on the up and up and being honest. Okay, so now what I'm going to ask you to do is to turn that piece of paper over again. So you have a blank sheet of paper in front of you. I'm going to give those um, the letters to you in a little bit of a different way. And then I'm going to ask you to take, um, take a look at it. So here we go. Another piece of paper. And now I'll take a look at it. All right, two seconds. Okay, you know the drill, so 15 seconds to write down as many of them as you can. Five more seconds. All right, so how many of you got more than you did the first time? I would hope that all of us did. So the moral of the story, right, is the reason why we got more on the second one is why? Because it has? Groupings. 
and meaning. Some groupings and those, and, and those groupings have meaning to us, right? We understand FBI and JFK and NATO and things like that. And so, <laughs> what, um, you know, we're, bless you, where we really want to go with this is that, you know, trying to kind of looking at that juxtaposition between fact and reality. So again, if we were to look at reality, what we really mean is that fact and reality is, is truly, when we start to associate fact, it's because we have a story that has provided us with a meaning. So our brains actually can't process the difference between fact and fiction. It's because we have a cultural understanding of what a fact is. We have a meaning that's been placed behind it that, that we start to quickly grasp it and understand that. So um, as, as, we, as we move into that, one of the things that, that this is something that I like to say, which is every fact is a work of fiction, because um, I have this ongoing debate with several of my friends around, um, around the difference between fiction and nonfiction. And, and truly there's not. What we have and what we understand is our brain understands story. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's kind of jump into to a couple different um, experiences as we go into this. So first off, the goal of education is to truly acquire information. Like that's what we want. We want to take this unknown that we didn't have and we want to understand it. We want to bring it into our own. And so how can we do that? So what are some practical ways that we can introduce story into our world to help understand and acquire this information? Well, first and foremost, um, my favorite way to do this is to take your content area and completely geek out about it. So I was an English teacher. I was an English major. I absolutely adore all things literature and English. Yes, I love to diagram sentences. Yes, I love grammar. I love all of those things. And so what I mean by that is be okay being that person that is totally in love with your content and tell the stories about your content. Come in and share them. When we talk about being um, a storyteller in your classroom, I'm not necessarily saying that you have to read a story to your students every single day. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is using the power of story to connect with your with your. Um, with your students, with your audience, with your learners. Uh, so one of my um, one of my dearest memories as a student was my math teacher from high school, and he was a triple doctorate from Berkeley. He had his um, PhD in math and uh, chemistry and physics, and was absolutely brilliant. And how he taught was through story. He didn't teach us um, to memorize formulas. Instead, he explained all of our content um, in how it worked. I mean, he would tell us the reason that we have, um, we asked him one day, you know, why is Easter on a different time every single year at a different, you know, sometimes in a different month even. And he explained to us about the, the solstice and, and showed us how a parabola actually overlays with that. And, um, you know, we learned so much more. We were able to really hold on to that as opposed to just being, told, you know, this is what a parabola is and this is how it kind of works. And so, um, so, so geek out on that. Take your content. If you're a history teacher, why did you choose history? Why did you choose physics? Like, why is it that that was the, the, the test that you went after and you want to stand up in front of it? Um, the other part of it is mix and match. So don't be afraid to mix um, personal stories or popular stories with your content. You know, shake it up and um, add different things into it. Uh, so when I taught To Kill a Mockingbird, it was right after, uh, I remember one of the years that, um, that, that I was teaching was right after uh, um, How to Train Your Dragon came out. And so I pulled part of How to Train Your Dragon where um, the, uh, the main character, where Hiccup, um, actually starts to interact with Toothless for the first time, with the dragon for the first time. And I, I pulled that snippet and played that for my kids and then ask them to compare and contrast that with, with um, some characters from To Kill a Mockingbird, and I didn't narrow it down for them. Inevitably, they pulled Boo Radley with Toothless and um, Scout with, with Hiccup, and so it's, it's a really great way for um, our kids to start to understand and make connections and really, you know, connect in together with that, and so do that with, um, you know, in math, we have those built-in things, those things that make my palms sweat, those word problems, right, um, but, you know, create a true word problem create a true story problem that isn't just substituting out your local grocery store name, you know, in the middle of a, of a um, problem, but actually creating a story around that. And then um, lastly, I have awe and some. And so, you know, take those moments 
that truly let you, uh, you know, really find the awe in your content. So if it's a, um, if it's, if you're teaching science, really, truly, um, bring in that experiment. So often we find ourselves creating recipes in science and not experiments. Experiments are meant to be those things that like blow up in our face and we're totally shocked that it happened or it didn't, you know, work out quite the way that we wanted it to. Um, let those moments happen. Let that moment of awe happen um, so that it can start to shape how um, your students interact with your content. And, yeah, to me, um, I just, you know, what you're in science, it's like, um, as you're talking, I'm thinking what's kind of, instead of, teaching science it's like doing science right yeah. and in doing science Absolutely. you're developing the story and triggering a lot more parts of the brain than in teaching science where you're just trying to memorize things Absolutely. Like, like the series and of letters it, right the, right like if you're if we're sit down if we sit down and we try to force ourselves to memorize something we're we're going to have we may successfully do it you know we absolutely may but our opportunity to actually hold on to there's there's a difference between memorizing and learning, right? And I think that that I love that that you said that. I mean, like it's truly experiment with it and then engage in it and find that opportunity to jump in. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions or thoughts before we we jump in. So I'm just, you know, so I'm thinking, you know, these three strategies of geeking out and getting totally immersed in something, mixing and matching, using things from one, either one medium or to, compared to another or one story compared to another, and then letting kids um, kind of experience that, oh, maybe I, I have to learn this in order to learn to, in order to do something. Um, or I, or the realization that they that they need to learn something for some reason, those could be you know those those could be used in any of them could be re really used in any subject, right? Yeah, I think that that's the important part. I mean, you know, if we go back to to the original idea that our the first question that we naturally ask as as human beings is why, and and it's because we are driven to want to understand why something is the way that it is, and um, you know helping. The, the most natural question that we can ask in the classroom is why do I need to know this? That's not a snarky question that an eighth grader asks. The reason why people want to know why something is, is because they want to know like, what's the relevance for this? When am I going to use this again? And we as educators need to be able to tell them when they're going to need to use this again and why it's important and you know, why it happened. And um, you know, that's the part that people, fall in love with like when you fell in love with your content you didn't fall in love with your content because you memorized a formula you fell in love with your content because it made sense to you because it appealed to you because you know there was some kind of thing that you didn't know how it worked until all of a sudden this light bulb came on and then you couldn't get enough of that information you know you started to to look up you know, people that were influential in there and you found their life story and you found out where they, you know, came in with it and you started to practice and, and, and memorize um, everything that you could about them, right? Like I was also an athletic coach. I was a basketball coach and a track coach. And we do this around sports all the time. Like as soon as you find an athlete that you identify with, then you want to know everything that you can about them. You want to know where they went to school, where they grew up, what their favorite colors are, their favorite soft drink is, all this stuff because it tells us about that person so you know finding that and that's that's like every dream that we have as an educator is how to turn that light on for our kids and get them fired up and passionate about it so if you were there's a, a really interesting question um, that Anna uh, Amna raised um, and it's on geek out and how do how would you apply it to something other than English um, so let's just say that you were teaching history like what's, what would be an example of geeking out when you were teaching history? So I think it depends. Um, you know, if you're like, if you're talking about, <laughs> it, it truly depends on what grade level and what content area it is mm -hmm. that you're talking about. So um, it's taking that content and, and really finding all of the things that you can about that, right? Like whether it's talking about the historical um, influences that that um, a presidential candidate had, whether it's you know talking about the enemy situations that came in before um, wars were 
uh, were, were established, um, whether it's the religious, you know, implications that happen between persecutions in, in particular areas. You know, it's, it's, it's finding those stories because those are the stories that we connect with and that we're interested in. Um, and so it's kind of becoming that detective. It's, it's that, you know, how, how can you make that exactly. there and mm-hmm. make that interesting? Mm-hmm. So, um, so I'm trying to th- think of like, an, um, like, let's say you were teaching, I don't know, civil war, you're teaching world war one. And so geeking out when you, when you're talking about detectives is to like challenge the class, like, maybe um well you know what else could have happened other than world war one and why do you think world war one happened and have them really get into the time period about what caused this war which was supposed everybody thought at the time was the war that was going to end all wars right and so you can find it uh, and i i would i would encourage you as the teacher you've got to start that right like you can't just assign passion to people, you have to exhibit passion yourself. So you have to show, oh my gosh, let me talk to you about, and you know, whether it's creating that introductory story um, that then kind of gets them turned into it. Uh, you know, the Heath brothers, um, Chip, Chip and Dan Heath have a, a fantastic story that they share about um, the battlefield surgeons and that there was a, a teacher who, when he was mm-hmm. teaching, you know, the civil war that they, he would go in and, um, and of course this was high school and I'm not saying I'm not advocate. I didn't do this. This is from a book. I'm not advocating that, that this is going to work for everybody. But one of the, um, one of the, the stories that they share is that this particular teacher would go to the butcher shop and bring in a joint, um, a jointed uh, piece of meat. And then he would have a saw and would have the kids saw through the joint, through the bone to, to let them, simulate what it was like to be a battlefield surgeon um, in the Civil War, where you're talking about amputations happening right there on the field and, you know, what all that looks like. And um, it's creating that kind of hook motion where all of a sudden you've brought that to life. And, and um, you know, it's, again, I'm not, not saying that that's what everybody should do, but, um, you know, it certainly sets the tone and brings it um, into a way that, that we can really wrap our minds around. Uh Oh, Mitch, you're still muted. I'm I'm so sorry. Thank (laughs) you. And, and other, you know, other people uh, who are participating, feel free to ask questions. I'm going to thank you for asking that question. And um, I had heard some background noise, so I temporarily muted you, but if you want to come online and, and if you have further questions, feel, you know, we'd love to hear them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well then I'm going to, I'm going to keep going in the meantime. And again, just feel free to interrupt me. I taught middle school and high school, so I'm used to being interrupted. I have little kids myself. So, uh, so I absolutely love that. Um, if you, if you want to jump in. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk over this video for a second. Right. So um, oftentimes, this is what we see happen in our classroom, right? We, we don't have, you know, kind of going back to that question, we don't have um, everyone's full attention. And uh, especially when we start talking through some of those more historic um, facts and figures type classes or type lectures, uh, like, again, as an English teacher, I'll tell you, grammar is going to put kids to sleep really, really quickly. Um, and so, you know, if we look at our numbers, this is what we're seeing overall. And we know this, we've known this for a long time that um, engagement drops off, um, especially the older that we get. Uh, Mitch, you and I were kind of having a similar conversation, not about classrooms, but about um, you know, our opportunities to interact with other people. And we, we become more reserved the older that we get. Um, m- many people will postulate that's because we are such a compliance driven um, society or we, you know, as we were talking about those rules of decorum and, and social, um, social normisms or it, whatever the case would be, but um, we start to see that engagement dwindle. That's really difficult when you start thinking about the the content that we're trying to get when we start talking about secondary, right? Seventh, eighth, ninth, twelfth grade, we are shoving so much content, so much really, really important content that's going to shape, you know, where our kids are going um, 
post high school, if they're going into career, if they're going into college, we, we feel very strongly that they need this information, but they're not engaged in it. And we know if they're not engaged, they're really not um, retaining it. And so what do we do about that? What does that look like? And how, how does the story, you know, kind of come into that? So, um, you know, I think that, that we're in an age that many of us would, would say we have access to more information um, than we've ever had at any point in time in, in world history. And, and yet, and we're more connected than we've ever been. We're more engaged with, uh, we are not engaged, but we're more aware of information than any time ever before. But yet our numbers from our, um, our education are showing that we're not quite uh, getting it, right? Like I, I, my dad was a college professor. I live in a town I, with a, a university and I do a lot of work with our university here. And I hear that over and over again. Our kids aren't prepared. Our kids aren't prepared, yet we have information and we have access to this. So what's going on? Um, so let's take a look at this word problem, right? Um, and this is a typical math question. So uh, we would see something like this. Bottled water costs 8.4 cents an ounce. Municipal water in San Francisco, 0 0.0033 cents per ounce. So my math people out there uh, represent the phrase in an expression. So if I just pause here for a second, how many of us can, can take this and, and put that into a mathematical conversation for us? Like what would be an acceptable answer in math to explain this? And all I'll tell you is most often, this is the converse, that that's what we see, right? We see like the wide eyes and the blink blink and nobody gets it. Everybody just sits there and they're like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. That means that one of them is bigger than the other. And we don't know how to articulate the differences that are in there. But if instead I said that, you know, water in San Francisco is actually, um, brought in from the Yosemite National um, Park and that EPA has certified it clean so much so that it doesn't even have to be filtered anymore. Um, and, uh, and, and you're going to start to understand the story a little bit better, right? And then if I go in and I say, hey, if you were to buy a, a bottle of Evian water, for and, and that same water that's going to come from you were to drink that bottle of water and then you were to take that bottle and fill it up with San Francisco tap water it would take you this many times 10 years five months and 21 days to before you would spend the dollar 83 that you would on that bottle of water right so like if we start our brain starts to understand that in a way that is so much better than just spitting facts and figures because we can really start to build this awareness and this meaning around that so um again kind of in this world where we're super super connected with all this information how do we start to break this down like this was the question that everybody kept asking of how does this match up in a classroom so that we can get there um, and this is where we kind of start to move into, we've talked about the goal of education was to acquire information, but the goal of learning is to connect information, which means that we've got to have that personal connection. We've got to have that inference. We've got to have that meaningful attachment to this information to make it move from information to learning. So that way we're going to kind of retain it and, and come into it. So um, what does that look like? And we are in a situation now where we have access to digital tools, we have competing resources for us, we have all of these different things that are basically demanding that we be turned on and engaged by all of these things that are you know capturing our attention and vying for our attention at all ages and stages and how does that work into into the classroom and so um you know i think that the big piece in here is that we've got to start to activate interest and how do we you know we're so we're going to talk now we're going to start to kind of move into some digital storytelling you know opportunity so how can we activate interest that then is going to help us feel compelled and and want us to do something with that that then also moves into this personalized experience for us right so how can we take these you know mathematical concepts and make them interesting that make us want to be involved with them and then make us want 
to use them in our everyday lives. Um, so, you know, I think that, that, that this is where we you know, really are going to rely on story a lot um, uh, because it is truly the most meaningful and most effective way to establish neural connections and to establish content connections. So just, just um, to what extent, so, so as you're saying this, to what extent are you meaning for the teacher to create the stories for, the, for her students or his students, or to what extent are you, are you suggesting that the students should be creating the stories? So I think the answer is both. Both? Because How I could think it be both? That, no, yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Because I think that one of the things that's really important, and I'm glad that you that you brought that up, and and we're gonna kind of look at the neuroscience for a second behind what story does to our brain, um, and that's why it's so important for for us as teachers to rely on story to communicate. But then, um, and and then we'll move into how students can then own the story and process that themselves, because where our when our brains are most fully engaged is when story is happening so we need that information to come at us through a story but then we also need to share that information through a story so that's why it's kind of both right so so let's take a look at the at the brain science behind this so first and foremost what ends up happening is that the, um, that story actually simulates neural coupling. And, and what I mean by that is how many times have you watched a, a commercial? I could probably say the ASPCA commercial, right? And almost instantly everybody's going, oh, they're hearing the Sarah McLaughlin song and their eyes kind of tear up or whatever the case is because our brains match up the emotions of what is happening on there. And we suddenly feel like it's happening to us, even though it hasn't happened to us. And, and so where, where that comes in is because cortisol has been released the minute that we start to have our attention, um, you know, kind of th that there's been this, this need for our attention. So whether it's distress or whether it's, you know, um, something exciting or whatever the case is, our brain releases cor cortisol. And then after it releases cortisol, then we start to see um, the, the release of, um, of, of oxytocin that's gonna come in. And so oxytocin is where we're gonna have that moral opportunity. If I like you, then I'm going to identify with you and that empathy is going to come. And, um, and that uh, stems off of dopamine. So we've got this perfect trifecta that happens with, so dopamine um, is that feel good moment, right? Like it's, it's, so something grabs our attention, dopamine is released, which then like makes us like it because it's something that we can feel kind of good about, which is going to actually give us some intensity around that information. And then if we have those two things connect in and we like it, then we're going to identify with you and we're going to have some empathy that's going to come in. And so um, that's one of the reasons why uh, whenever we talk about a story, we always have to have the hook. We always have to have that connecting point. So that's our attention. Then we've got to have some humor or some opportunity to, um, you know, have that connection through vulnerability or whatever that case is. That's where that dopamine comes in. That's going to make us remember it even more. And then we have that release of oxytocin, which is that connection point. That's the, um, again, it's the moral molecule. It's that piece that helps us feel closer to someone. When all three of those things happen, then we have equity and we have, or excuse me, not equity, we have empathy that's been created through those things. Um, which and just providing, providing, to there, providing there isn't too much cortisol, right? Because too much awareness or distress then um, reduces the amount of oxytocin and dopamine and, and puts you in a state where you're not resourceful. But a little right. bit of cortisol it, puts you into a state where you're much more resourceful. Right. And it's actually true for all of those things. Do, if you have too much oxytocin, it's, you're going to have, so you, you, you don't want to have too much oxytocin either. You don't want to have too much dopamine either. So it is this perfect little blend, which is why um, story is universal, right? We have this universal story arc. We have all these universal pieces that come in. So when it's done in just the right way, then we start to have all that. That's kind of that, that, that really balances out pretty nicely. So that said, um, you know, one of the things that I, that I do want to come in and say is that we do have all of these connection points. We have, you know, digital story that's coming in, coming to us constantly through social media, through our majillion channels, through Netflix, through all of this stuff, right? Um, but bigger doesn't necessarily mean that it's better. And telling doesn't mean that we're teaching either. 
so we can stand up in front of class and we can tell all of these facts, but we're not actually teaching it unless we're connecting it into people. And, um, and so let's kind of look at some of these ways, because again, we would say that we are at this weird juxtaposition where we are more connected than we've ever, ever, ever been, yet we're also less connected to other people than we've ever been. And, and, or at least that's the thought that's happening a lot out there. So um, as we, as we kind of move into this piece, I want to talk about the golden age of story, which is really where we're at thanks to the technology advancements and, and what that can look like in our classrooms coming into these, these pieces. So first and foremost, um, because of our day and age, we have this expectation for interaction and involvement. Like right now, every single person that's involved in this chat um, is expecting to get some information, is interacting, is, is, is involved in this way. We, um, we expect our vote to count. We expect um, to be entertained. We expect for our attention to be held. Um, and, and, you know, we know that the stories that are built around emotion, however, are the ones that we remember the most. So again, spouting out, spouting off facts aren't going to get us there, but we've got to connect it in with emotion. So that said, I'm going to show this quick video. Um, many of you may have seen it. It's, uh, it's Apple's newest commercial for, um, for Christmas time. I'm not sure the sound is coming through for us. So, yeah, you may have to describe. Okay, do I need, do you want me, is it not playing? Well, it's playing, but the sound isn't coming through. Oh, okay, hold on one second. The sound's not coming through? Okay. Um, and it may be because Zoom is picking up from one source and this is, you know, and this is transmitting through a different source or a different. Okay. Output. Okay. Okay. So, um, well, I can share it in, I can, how about this? I'll just share the video in the resources later. And so then that way everybody can, Thank, yep. can in, okay. the, in the interest of time. But um, so in this video, it's, it, it basically plays off of a lot of the stereotypes that we have around kids these days. Right. So if I were to say kids these days, many of us would talk about how they um, they all have their iPads that it's the iPads are becoming or their devices, whatever, what have you, whatever flavor it's going to be. Of course, this is an Apple commercial. So that's the one that they're talking about in here and that the parents are leaving for a trip. And so they want to make sure that the iPad is charged. They want to make sure that they have movies that are downloaded for it. And then what are they going to do? They're going to give it to the kids as a babysitter right and then the kids are just going to sit there and they're just going to watch these videos and they're zombied over on the side and not interacting with their family and so it fast forwards they get to their grandfather's house and um the these girls are that are constantly on their ipad and they're not engaging with with the grandpa mom and dad are saying be quiet around grandpa you know don't don't bother him don't do all this stuff the, the commercial keeps going and going and um and and they start to ask him you know don't don't ask too many questions don't um you know they're they're continuing to use that the ipad as a pacifier and um suddenly they find a box that has all of these videos and treasures and kind of memory box um and it shows their grandmother who um you start to realize has has recently passed away and so the grand, the the girls decide that they are going to go around and take pictures and they take um all of these mementos and they drop in the video and they make this montage video telling the story about their parents and how um, their their grandparents met and then they had their mom and then their mom married their dad and then their dad had you know then they had these two girls of which are them and they present this as their Christmas present to um, to their grandfather and um, you know suddenly everything is brought back into full focus over the story and how important it is to um to this family that that uh they they share these things and um so it's this idea you know that um these tools these digital tools that we have 
actually we can use them and use their powers for good and that it's not this idea that our kids are um, are on them all the time because they're just staring at content and they're just using it as this um, you know source of entertainment but actually you know what happens when we put them in charge of creating the stories instead of just consuming the stories so um, uh, again it's a really powerful um, commercial it's a variation of one that they had uh, I think in 2014 there was a similar one um, but uh, it's definitely uh, a tearjerker one um, out there for sure uh, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll share that but those are kind of the highlights from it but um, with that I kind of want to want to shift into having students own their story and and uh, what do we mean by that so um, you know I think I think this this particular quote from Brene Brown is really uh, it's really powerful for me because I think that again um, you, you've probably figured out that I, I hear a lot like it makes sense for you to talk about story because because that's a humanities thing or that's an English thing but um, really and truly stories are data with soul and so how do we take these numbers and we provide them and, and present them in an emotional way in order to to get people to connect with them so um, my first and foremost way of doing this in a one-to-one -one classroom or in one-to-one -one settings is um, I'm a huge believer in app smashing and so um, regardless of if you're uh, in, in a Chromebook district or at an Apple district or a Windows district or whatever your flavor is, um, you know, these are, there, there's some examples here of all different kinds. Um, but my favorite, um, my favorite rule is that it's gotta be something that allows a student to demonstrate. So we're gonna kind of talk about what that looks like. Um, but if you're not familiar with app smashing, it sounds exactly like what it is. You take two or more and you shove them together in order to, uh, to create something. And, and most frequently, you are um, making a photo in something or making a video in something and then you're bringing it into another thing to add in a, another app or another platform in order to layer onto that. Um, so uh, when, I, when I do these things, these are the things that I try to keep in mind. So first and foremost, I think about placeholders. And I, um, I, I don't want my students to regurgitate. That's not what I'm after. I want them to demonstrate. And so um, this is why we ask our kids to show their work. This is why we ask them to you know, really kind of give us their thought process behind that. Um, as a, if I'm, a, you know, my brother is a math teacher. If I'm a math person and I ask my students to show their work, um, like looking at my son's homework when he shows his work I don't know what he was thinking all I know is that he wrote it down but I don't I can't tell what order he did it in in order to tell him where his error was but if he demonstrates it in a video through a whiteboard app or whatever the case is I can start to see where his errors come in and then we can have a conversation about that um, one of the other things that is really important to me when we start talking about digital storytelling is that choice ensures opportunity and that's going to contradict um, or, or kind of contrast a little bit with how voice ensures um, metacognition and this will make a little bit more sense here in just a minute. Um, and then first and foremost, uh, creativity is really, really important to me. So I think creativity is actually what deepens the rigor, not complexity. Creativity is how we get to own something and build it and make it ours. Um, complexity oftentimes just gets read as hard and we can make something too hard instead of just making it, you know, really become our own so um, but but when we smash it together then we get to we start to get those complexities that come through in that way so let's take a look at um, at some templates that might kind of get us there so this is uh, looking at just an example of, of a prompt that I could give some of our kids and um, I would have them you know take sock puppets which this is an app sock puppets and I would ask them to using the sock puppet app, create a video explaining your lunch choices for today and where and what you'll eat. So um, probably not a, a prompt that I would use in the classroom, but for our purposes today, it kind of makes sense. Um, the reason why I call this an openly lead prompt is because uh, they're going to always work together. There's always gonna be a camera person and there's always gonna be somebody who's, um, who's on camera but they're going to be able to have some peer collaboration, which is gonna be really important as they develop knowledge of the tool. Um, because I'm naming the tool of what I want them to use. I want them to use this app 
chances are between the two of them, they'll know something about it and they'll be able to kind of develop it as they go through it. All right, this is different than this particular prompt, which is, um, I call this kind of your choose your own adventure prompt. And so in this one, it's create a video explaining the sound of a siren and what it means when you're driving in traffic. And so here, they're going to be able to use whatever um, app they want, whatever platform they want, as long as it yields a video. And so this is going to allow them to have some personal vision and some personal voice um, that's going to let their their personality shine through, right? And um, And you're going to see why, I mean, there's so many questions that can come from there. As a teacher, I can ask them, why, why did you choose this one? You know, if it wasn't the best choice, then I can lead them to a different one. Or it may be something that I've never heard of before. And now they get to teach me something. You know, there's so many different ways that, that, um, that they can take that and, and kind of build forward. So that said, um, you know, filling these questions with opportunities that allow for exploration rather than explanation are going to be really important to get that true story. Because again, remember, we're not after regurgitation, we're after demonstration, because that's where we're really going to start to get that ownership and that agency for students um, as, they, as they move into it. So here is, um, this is, this is a, a sample prompt that I do with, um, uh, in some of my sessions over, um, this one's particularly from um, my formative assessments. Um, and, and so I'm gonna give you a, a couple, you can read the, the box on here, but often what I will do is I'll have um, my, my participants work in groups together and then they, they kind of work their way through this in order to demonstrate this particular skill that I'm asking them um, that, that we're talking about. So in this particular one, we're looking at formative assessment, and we're looking at the idea of a three, two, one chart. And so um, what, they, what they will do is they're going to use Chatterpick to actually, um, that, that app, which is, it's a, it's, a, it's a really fantastic app. It's actually, um, uh, I guess, advertised for, um, for a much younger audience than what I typically use it with, but I use it a lot with secondary students as well as adults because you can snap a picture and then draw a line across it and you talk into it and then it animates the picture that you've just taken. So if you're in a math class, for example, and you've written out the question and, um, and they've shown their work, then they can take a picture of it, slide it across, and then give the explanation behind why they um, why they, they want to, or why they solved it that way. Or um, you could use it as an extension activity of now that they've um, solved the question, then um, they can say how they would apply that. What would be a real um, world, an authentic application of that formula um, to be used um, as they move forward? And so um, what you'll see in this particular example, the, the, the app that I smash it with is for it then to be uploaded. Um, that, that QR code actually goes to a Padlet. And so then it goes up to Padlet where then there's interaction and collaboration that happens um, on the back end behind that. So here's another example of, um, of the same situation where we're talking about this, but using um, Adobe Spark Post. And so they go into Spark Post in order to use a picture to represent their understanding and their learning. And so this is a different type of story. This is a visual story that's going to come um, out of this. And so uh, just like our, our oral traditions, um, visual tradition is really, really strong. We know that, that our brain actually processes pictures and visual, um, and, and visual elements much, much faster and at a, a much more um, concrete manner than it does um, than it does oral words or, or written words. And so adding that complexity of, of creating your own visual element becomes really important, um, regardless of whatever content you're talking about. Um, so uh, then, um, so, so this, these are just a couple prompts that, that I would use um, to really start helping my students build their own stories that are different than write me a once upon a time story or give me a um, paragraph telling me about, um, you know, the historical significance of President Reagan and President Gorbachev. You know, how can we start to move beyond those situations so that we're starting to get these connections as they move into that? So, um, 
Um, one of the things that um, I think is really, really important whenever we start talking about how do we transform storytelling is that we start to ask our kids to have a story about the process because we're, that's what we're actually after in the classroom is we're assessing their process, their process of learning um, that then is going to allow them to stretch their thinking beyond just giving me the information that I know over and over again. And then that's where they're going to get that ownership. They're going to get metacognitive by really truly identifying with it and creating their own story um, as they go in into those pieces. So. Uh, that said, um, these I'll, and I'll share these so that you'll have them uh, on the on the links from the download. But here's um, some really really common ways to capture these stories in classrooms, regardless of your content. Um, so looking at those three two ones, you know, how can we have kids engage in three two ones? Whether it's the I know I, you know I know I wonder I learned or something that I've learned that I want to know more about or that I want to question. So got um, several different apps that are down here, Flipgrid, Chatterpix, um, Draw and Tell, Bulb Digital Portfolios. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I totally blanked on that one for a second, but um, <laughs> Padlet and uh, Seesaw and Adobe Video and um, Pick Collage for kids, um, or Pick Collage for education. And so having these things where they can take pictures and then kind of bring them in um, and, and share that. So. Is that Buncey? Is that the B for Buncey? No, B is for Bulb Digital Portfolios. Bulb digital. Okay. So, um, yeah, and if you if you haven't had a chance to, to interact with them, it's a really fantastic uh, digital portfolio opportunity where you can upload video and audio and um, all different kinds of things. And so, again, just, you know, what are some ways that we can have that complexity where we can really give kids the opportunity to explain their thinking? So, um, I, I, I kind of, have, I know we're really bumping it up close to time, so I don't want to, I'm not going to go through each and every single one of these, um, because I know that we, you know, we, we, I, I can share them out there, but I want to, um, pause and, and turn that over to, um, to questions and, and see if there's things that I can help answer out there for you guys. So you, uh, back a few, t a few slides ago, you were building kind of scaffolding to have um, students and um, whether they were secondary students or whether they were they were um, education students who, who were um, or, or student teachers that you were that you were coaching you know maybe maybe think of a science example like if you're trying to teach or um, I don't know momentum or um, or dinosaurs, how would you scaffold questions to have kids develop a story about dinosaurs or biomes? So I think that number one, the big piece is changing your mindset around what we mean by story. Because I think so often we think it has to be a once upon a time made up story with characters in order for it to be story. Um, so one of my favorite things to do around science um, with, uh, so I'll say, I'll take like fourth grade science, for example, talking about momentum, you said momentum. So one of my, one of my favorite things to do is to take the kids out to the playground and have them illustrate the, you know, illustrate the laws of, um, uh, you know, Newton's laws, right? So let's look at what does the laws of motion and, and, and momentum and all these different pieces. And so you can use um, an app, a, a GIF app, so, um, or you, if you have an iPad, you can switch it over into live, um, live photos. And uh, one of my favorite apps is called Lively, um, which takes live photos and just flips it into, um, into a quick video for you really quickly. But, uh, you know, have the kids actually demonstrate, you know, getting in a swing and what does that, what does that force of motion look like? Um, and then like ha have them record it on a live video, bring that into something like, Pick Collage, where you know, Pick Collage Edu, where they can upload the video and then they can use text to explain what they were thinking as they go along. So what they've done is they've created a story. It's both a visual story and it's an 
auditory story or a written story. Um, the story that they're going to say is how they, because they're now the character in their story, is experiencing that momentum, right? So the story arc becomes how they, you know, what, what were the things that they did? what happened whenever they did the experiment, and then what was the resolution that they came from, right? And so that becomes the story that goes along with it. Um, does that make sense? I mean, I think, it, I think that, that that's the challenge that I, it, it's kind of changing your brain around, you don't have to write a once upon a time story in order to use story in the classroom. Like, the information that's shared in a biography is story. The information that, you know, and so. Well, story yeah. is, is what I'm gathering is the way you're, you're, you're describing it. It's a um, story is the way we all make sense of everything, period. And so when you yeah. say develop, a, you know, you're, you, through storytelling, it's really letting the, the students, um, describe how they're making sense of a situation. So your example about momentum, if you were to give, you know, three kids a ball, you know, you could, you could say, I want you to, you know, create a video of you using the ball and describing how momentum is interacting with that ball or how that, you know, or, or not interacting with the ball. And so Absolutely. they're and describing the whole process. And so it's not a, as you said, it's not a once upon a time story. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's the, it's the explanation of what's happening. It's how they're making sense of the situation. Absolutely. And that's what story is. That's what teaching is. It's explanation of content in, in an engaging way that people then can process it and understand it and they, mm -hmm. and, and get ownership of it. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think you had asked at the very beginning, how does that connect into coaching? That's, that's exactly what we do. I mean, we use story to motivate people. We use story to um, incite uh, anger <laughs> or incite excitement or whatever the case is um, to celebrate successes. We, we use all of those things to, to create that that compelling opportunity. Um, so as a coach, like one of my very first challenges when um, I was going, when I was in a, uh, we were in a one-to-one -one district, we had, we were actually launching a one-to-one -one, um, program. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, that, the, I had a, a teacher at the high school. I asked them, you know, to tell me what it was that they were excited about, like what they were going to be doing now that they were moving into this. And I had a teacher tell me that he didn't know why, that he didn't know why this was happening. And he didn't know why he should care. And quite frankly, he wasn't excited about it. And um, it really reminded me of that, you know, the first time that you get that question of why do I need to know this myth? And, um, and I, I, I paused and was like, he's exactly right. No one has ever told him the story of why this is going to be important. And so mm -hmm. I shared um, several stories of teachers and students and why that was going to be, you know, something that they needed to go into. And, and suddenly it, it made sense to him. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so often we tell people instead of um, involve people. Fascinating. So um, we're actually, I, I'm looking at the time and we're, th we're three mm -hmm. minutes past where we're supposed to be. So if you wanted, you know, what, what's one, two, or three things that you would want people either, either attending now or who are seeing the archive to really be able to take back with them? I think number one is change your mindset around story you know, number one, it's not, it's not, it's not a once upon a time, it's not a published article, it's not a, um, a it, it's not a, a, a written piece that goes out necessarily, it's truly, it's information, and it's engaging information, um, so I think that that's, that's the number one thing, um, then, then the second piece of that is listen for the stories that are out there. Listen to the stories that your students are telling you and that you are hearing about that content. Um, and then the third one would be remember why you became um, the teacher of your content and fall in love with the content that you're teaching. Um, so often we are challenged by 
the the heavy things that come along with it where we become overwhelmed with the I have 156 standards that I have to cover in the next six months and I don't know how I'm going to get to it and instead we need to remind ourselves that this content is incredibly important and it's so worth learning and remember what those things are and then help people fall in love with it well thank you that yeah those are those are all important and um I, you know i up until two days ago i was planning <laughs> on going to fetc and then i just realized fet i get back from um my travels during fetc fetc is <laughs> a week earlier than it usually is this year and it i is, i just you know st stupid me you know i just wasn't paying attention so um so unfortunately, as much as I would love to be at FATC, I, I can't, I have not, maybe this is just a story, but I don't think I can be in two places at the same time. Well, you know, time travel is a story, but I don't know that it's one that we've been able to figure out okay. just yet. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, but maybe there will be, I'm sure there will be lots of, of uh, replays and, and resources shared. Yep. And so hopefully we'll be able to catch it on the replay then. Okay. And I hope to see you, um, you know, online or at, a, at some other event or that uh, we have a chance to touch base. This was, uh, thank you so much for, for appearing and adding your expertise mm -hmm. and, um, your strong ability to tell stories and to and and to coach teachers, and um, you know have have a very very happy holiday, uh, Merry happy Christmas, New Happy New Year's, and great to twenty twenty. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank okay. you, I appreciate it. Okay, Brianna, and this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm going to say uh, good night for EdChat Interactive, and hope to see you all at a future event. Bye.